Tonight, I don't have an opening scripture. I have an opening verse from a song. And so, we're just going to launch in, and I believe God is going to... It, it might be a little bit in your face tonight. I'm just going to warn you. It might be a little bit in your comfort zone. But it's something that's been on my mind for a few weeks. And so here we go. The words penned by the band need to breathe go like this. Days they force you back under those covers. Lazy mornings they multiply. Sounds like summer for high school students. But glory's waiting outside your window. So wake on up from your slumber. Open up your eyes. And these lyrics illustrate the battle that many of us face each morning. Surrounded by the warm hug of a duvet, nestled just right between the pillows, the mattress now formed to fit the position that you've slept in for the past eight hours. This is the battleground. It seems so peaceful. It seems so benign. But the peace is shattered by the piercing sound of the incessant beeping of the alarm clock. The struggle is real. Can I get a witness? The struggle is real. You've got to wake up. Whether it be for school, for work, for my case, maybe it's for golf, maybe for hockey, maybe breakfast with friends, maybe it's an early flight out of town, or maybe, just maybe, in a few weeks, you'll be getting up at an ungodly hour to go Black Friday shopping. Any witnesses in the house on that one? Eric, where are you? Black Friday shopping. You've got to wake up. We've all found ourselves weighing the options as we, as we ease into consciousness. We're groggy. We're not all there yet. And we're thinking, can I just hit the snooze button and return to my dream world? That was awesome. There were actually unicorns. And pigs did fly. And I was Batman. And it was awesome. It was incredible. It was awesome. Anybody ever dreamed that they were Batman? No? Okay. I'm the only one. But sleep. Yes, I got one over there. All right. Sleep. It's a wonderful place. It's a place of healing. It's a place of restoration. Your body needs sleep to function properly. A good night's sleep brings a morning filled with energy and vitality. And you can get so much work done from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. And if you've never been up that early, you'll have to take my word for it. Um, Not that I'm up at five very often, but when I am, like once every 365 days, it's wonderful. It's awesome. It's sleep. It's incredible. Sleep is also a place to dream. Jacob dreamed, and he had an encounter with God at Bethel. Joseph, he dreamed a dream, and it led him to, to leading the nation of Egypt. Dreams were instrumental in promoting Daniel in Babylon, and it was a dream that told Joseph to flee before Herod could find the baby Jesus. Dreams often have prophetic significance, and they can be a source of guidance and assurance in dark times. And you know what? Dreamers are an essential part of the book of Acts Church, of which we are a part tonight. Acts chapter 2, verse 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And so we're a book of Acts Church, right? So if I see anybody nodding off while I'm preaching, good on you. Good on you. You're fulfilling scripture. And as long as you let us know what deep prophetic mysteries have been revealed to you while you slumbered, it's totally cool. But seriously, sleep does have purpose in the life of a believer. But there's a more ominous side to sleep. When sleep occurs at the right time and in the right place, It's all that we just talked about, except for the sleeping in church part. But sleeping in the wrong place, at the wrong time, can have disastrous results. Sleeping behind the wheel of a car has horrific consequences. You might never wake up. And sleeping physically in the wrong place, at the wrong time, is dangerous. 
But falling asleep spiritually in this culture and in this end time could be eternally devastating. Because Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Prophecy points to it. And like a woman travailing while giving birth, the signs of the times are upon us and they're coming at us quicker and quicker and quicker. And we have things around the world like ISIS and Hamas and the Taliban, jihadists around the globe pushing their agenda and we have felt their wrath now on our shores. The Ebola virus has sent, sent shockwaves of fear across the globe as a potential pandemic and has wreaked havoc in African nations. Almost a billion people on our planet go hungry every day. 20,000 children die every day due to malnutrition. 780 million people lack access to clean water and 99% of water-related deaths occur in the developing world. That's a bleak picture of the world in which we live. And while we must maximize our efforts to assist people in these areas, all of these are signs that point towards a soon and coming king. They point towards the coming of Jesus Christ. And he confirms this in Matthew chapter 24 when his disciples ask him, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of that coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answers and says unto them, take heed, listen up. That no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. And all of these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And right now, going on around the world, Christians are being crucified and slaughtered because they believe in Jesus Christ. That's the reality of the world in which we live and we are so blessed to live in a country that we live in today. And then shall many be offended. The politically correct system of our world and politics leaves many offended at the gospel of Christ. Leaves many offended that someone would say that the lifestyle that you're living is not pleasing unto God. And offenses are abounding. Many people are being offended and they're betraying one another. And hatred runs rampant. Many false prophets are rising and deceiving many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But at the end of this bleak picture that Jesus paints, he also gives a glimmer of hope. In verse 13 and 14, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And aligning with the words of Peter in Acts chapter 2, Jesus says that the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations and then shall the end come. So as the signs of the times are getting bleaker and more severe, at the same time that this is happening, there is an unprecedented global outpouring of the Holy Ghost around the world. The darker the night gets before the coming of Jesus Christ, the brighter the light of the church is going to shine around the world. That's the end times that we're living in. And so we know that the times are upon us. This is the time in which we live. Jesus is coming soon. It won't be long now until we take a step and our feet catch nothing but air as we ascend into glory as the church of the living God. And Paul paints a picture of it for us. He says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on, put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, and this is the hope of the church, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, but the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And we're called to live in expectation of this event called the rapture. And Paul exhorted us in Titus again, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you've repented of your sins, turning your life over to Jesus Christ, and if you've been baptized in Jesus' name, all of your sins washed away in a watery grave of baptism, which we're going to witness in a few moments. And if you've got the gift of the Holy Spirit uh, flowing in your life, and, and if you've received that gift as evidenced by speaking in an unknown language that God speaks through you, then you can sing with the elders that this world is not my home. I am just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Goodbye, world. I stay no longer with you. Goodbye, pleasures of sin. I stay no longer with you. I've made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life, so goodbye, goodbye, world. One of these mornings that won't be very long, you're going to look for me and I'll be going home. I'm going up to heaven where I'm going to sing and I'm going to shout and there is nobody that is going to ever push me out because I'm going to a city over there. I've got a mansion on streets of gold and I may face hardships and trials and tribulations in this present life, but I'm living with a hope of glory. I'm living with a hope that someday I take a step and I hear the trumpet sound and I come up and I see Jesus face to face. I see Jesus face to face. That's why we live this thing. That's why we live this Christian life because we have a blessed hope that God is going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. That there will be no more sickness, there will be no trial, there will be no more death, there will be no more pain for the former things are passed away. We have an incredible hope, church. We have an incredible hope. But Paul spoke to the church in Thessalonica concerning the last days and he warned the church about the coming of Jesus Christ. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have not need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, the rapture, so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. They shall not escape. It's coming as a thief in the night. As a thief in the night. And my question to you is, are you ready? My question to you is, church, are you asleep? My question is, have you allowed things of this life, voices from the world around you, to drown out the voice of God? Paul was writing to people that knew that Jesus was coming back. He was writing to people that that they should have known. They should have been aware. But he still felt the urgency to warn them of what was coming down the pipe. And in verse 6, he says, Therefore, let us not sleep. Let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love for an helmet of salvation. For God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, G and Paul spoke about the second coming as a thief in the night because Jesus spoke about his second coming as a thief in the night. In Matthew chapter 24, when you see all of these things, all of these signs that we just talked about come to pass, know that the end is near. It's even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. 
Nobody knows the day or the hour that Jesus Christ is coming back. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and it took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In Noah's day, they didn't see it coming. They, they, they didn't see it coming. They were asleep, unaware of the imminent, imminent destruction of the world by water. And the Bible describes Noah as a preacher of righteousness. So they had an alarm clock, if you will, sounding in their ear, but they didn't hear his voice. They paid no attention. They hit the snooze button. Their wake-up call came, but they just ignored it. And it's going to be the very same, and it is the very same today with the rapture of the church. The end of the world has become a profit-making enterprise for Hollywood's business model. People have seen end-of-the-world scenarios played out on a screen so much that they are dulled to the reality that Jesus is coming back soon. And so life goes on until a day on God's calendar comes that looks just like every other day. The sun rises just like every other day. People go to work just like every other day. People kiss their children goodbye as they go to school just like every other day. And then shall two be in the field and one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Watch Therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come, but know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Somebody say, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And the worst place I can be tonight is asleep. The worst position I can be in tonight is just going through life, just, just coasting through life, just, just asleep at the wheel of life, just allowing the, the, the things and the jobs and the priorities and, and, the, and the demands of life to dictate my priorities eternally. And it's time tonight. God is stirring us in the last couple of weeks. He's stirring us this morning to repentance, and he's stirring us again tonight to wake up to wake up because there's a fearful dichotomy that's prophesied and it's happening right now as we see it as we near the end of time on one side there's a group of people who recognize that Jesus is coming back and they're getting their house in order for the coming of the Lord but on the other side there are those who seem to have fallen asleep living in a dream world called career or Hollywood or relationships or technology or money And whatever dream world they inhabit, they share one common trait. They are not ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. They have followed the pattern of Lot who pitched his tent towards Sodom and eventually moved in and took up residence in that wicked city. Now let me remind you, church, that you may live in this world right now, but you are not of this world. But you are strangers and you are pilgrims just passing through. We are not meant for this world. Church, we are not meant for this world. Young man, young lady, uh, married couple, senior saint, you are not meant for this world, but for the world to come. And we must not allow ourselves to become wrapped up in a blanket of earthly security and material possessions, lulled to sleep by the amount of stuff that we've received. All this stuff that you have, it's not yours anyways. God gave you the ability and the talent to earn that stuff, so it's really his. It's not yours, and it can be taken you from you in an instant. This stuff is not mine. I don't possess it. This world is not my home. My home is in heaven, a mansion prepared for me in glory. Some who are asleep, wrapped up in the comfort the blanket, the warmth of the riches, pleasures of this life. Some might even believe that they are ready. But if they were honest with themselves, they would see that their priorities are out of sync with Scripture. And they've allowed themselves to be given over to strong delusion. Others mock and laugh at the notion that Jesus is returning. And others dismiss Christianity as just a crutch for weak-minded people. 
But still others in this end time are bound in a prison of political correctness because a loving God would never judge sin. That's what they believe. That's what they live their life by. They just do what they want and they say, God's grace and mercy covers me. I'm good. I don't need to really change my life because of the grace and the mercy of God. That's the way people have twisted the word of God. But let me remind you today, once again, of the fact that hell is a real place. And it was created for the devil and his minions, not for you and not for me. But the reality is that many will find themselves one day eternally separated from God in a place of eternal torment. Jesus said, he, he, he admonished us, he said, enter in at the straight gate, the narrow gate, for wide is the gate. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there's going to be a whole lot of people that are going to take that road, the easy way, and trying to make it to heaven through their own terms and by their own way. And they're going to fall well, well short because all of our righteousnesses, all of the things that we think are good and pleasant and pleasing are as filthy rags before God. It's as filthy rags before God. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads unto life, and few there be that find it. How could God do that? How could God separate? How could God cast, how could a loving God cast people into a bottomless pit for all of eternity? How could that happen? Well, let me try and give you a little bit of an explanation and a little bit of a revelation of what the love of God really entails. Because heaven is a place of peace. It's a place of worship. It's a place free from sin and all of its side effects of sickness, pain, and sorrow. And if God were to allow every reprobate mind into glory, it would no longer be heaven but a continuation of the imperfection that we walk through today. And God has set aside these last couple of weeks to call us and to sound the alarm of the word of God in the ears of us assembled to wake up. Our flesh may not like preaching like we heard the last couple of weeks, but without the correction of the word of God, we can never be changed. We can never be changed unless he chastens us, unless he disciplines us. And his chastening, the word declares, is a sign of his love. Hebrews chapter 12 says that whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. I don't know about you, but I want to be a son of God. I want to be a daughter of God. I want to be a member of God's family. And if he loves me, then he's going to chasten me once in a while. He's going to call me on the carpet for something that I don't have right in my life. And I'm going to be faced with a decision and I'm going to have to humble myself and change my ways and walk in a different direction. That's the truth of the word of God. And that is an example of his divine, perfect love. A gospel that denies a change of life. A gospel that preaches inclusion of all with no requirement for change is a gospel that has no love. Oh, it rides the, on, it piggybacks on that concept of love. It says a loving God would never cast anybody into hell, but, but there is absolutely no love in that gospel. It's against scripture. And I ask you tonight, when was the last time that you felt true conviction in the presence of God? When was the last time God called you on the carpet and said, hey, listen up, Mike, you've got this thing in your life that, you know what, I've let it, I've let it kind of be there for a while, and I've let it grow there for a while, but it's time for you to cut that out. It's time for you to change that way of thinking. It's time for you to change that way of living. When was the last time you felt conviction that made you walk out of this place and make, it, make intentional changes in the way that you live your life? That's why we come to church. That's why we live this life. That's why we read the word of God because it's quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and it discerns the thoughts and tents of the heart. That's why we read this word so that we can be changed by this word. For the next few moments... God's going to get in our space a little bit. And it's because he loves us. We sung about it higher, higher, higher than heavens, deeper, deeper, deeper than oceans, greater, greater, greater than mountains. Your love. Well, this is an example of his love tonight. To make you a bit uncomfortable with where you're living. 
to wake you up. While the world is in the midst of unprecedented revival, there are some hearing this message tonight who've fallen asleep. And the Bible gives us so many examples of good people who let some things slide. They fell asleep at the wheel of their life and they found themselves in desperate times. There are those who prophesied in Jesus' name and did many wonderful works, but God, looking at them at the judgment, will say, depart from me, I never knew you. There are the five foolish virgins that Jesus spoke of who wasted their oil and were not prepared when the bridegroom came and they clamored and they banged at the door, pleading to be allowed into the marriage feast, but the door was shut. They didn't have another chance when they missed the coming of the bridegroom and they fell asleep. They missed it. If I were to run down the list of men and women who fell asleep in Scripture, we could be here all night. They're recorded in Scripture. The reason Scripture records the flaws and the character uh, traits that aren't pleasing to God in Scripture is because they are written unto us, Paul says, for our examples, for our admonition, for warning signs as we walk through life upon whom the ends of the world are coming. We are that generation. The end of the world is come upon us. We are in the last of the last of the last days and we need to pay attention to the examples that are in scripture for us. These are men and women who fell asleep on their relationship with God. They fell asleep in sin and idolatry. They're warning signs for us to be careful to not fall asleep. These men and women serve as alarm clocks. They they remind us to be careful, to be sober, to be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We've got to be vigilant. We've got to be awake. You can't coast. You can't just kind of go to sleep on God and then at that moment when the trumpet sounds, expect to be taken up with him you can't fall asleep you can't fall asleep and we're going to focus in on two examples of men of God powerful anointed men who fell asleep spiritually the first one is one of the most woeful tales of scripture a man of great strength and ability and anointing A man by the name of Samson. A man whom God had called to expel the Philistines from the land of Israel, but he fell asleep in the arms of a woman. And it began with a Philistine girl whom his parents said, you don't need to go after that girl. You don't need to marry that girl. You don't need to get in a relationship with her. But he didn't listen and he went anyways. And it ended with the one we probably all know, Delilah. And throughout his 20-year tenure as judge of Israel, Samson made it a habit to partake in sin. Time after time, he would come to his senses and God's anointing would return. And he even carried off the gates of Gaza in a moment of sincere repentance and empowerment from God. But then in Judges chapter 16, immediately after that moment where he was empowered and anointed again by God and he carries off the gates of the city, which is an incredible feat for one man, Samson meets a woman named Delilah. And that moment of repentance quickly turns back. And hers was the influence of a devious woman whom Solomon saw in Proverbs chapter 7. Guarded, cunning, manipulative, stubborn, sensual. And Samson enters into a relationship with this woman and is slowly lulled to sleep until he finds himself drifting off in her arms as his strength is literally taken from him. And Samson spiritually is so far asleep by the end that when Delilah says that the Philistines be upon you, Samson, he he awoke out of his sleep and he said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he didn't even know that God had departed from him. What a scary place to be. He was so far gone in slumber that he didn't know that God had left him. And what a scary place to be, to be coming to church, looking the part, acting the part, but bound by secret sin. You come to the church house and shake yourself. You might even talk in tongues a little bit. You might raise your hands, even come to the front at the end of service, but you leave his presence and you go right back into the arms of Delilah. 
You leave the presence of God where you can make a life change and you can leave and become different. But no, you choose to go back to that sin. You choose to go back to that lifestyle. You choose to go back and you think because you shake yourself on Sunday and you get a little goosebump that you're still okay. Falling asleep. You think you can handle it. You think you haven't gone too far. You think you haven't, you know, you haven't told her all your secrets yet. You haven't crossed that line yet. Wake up. Wake up. You can't play around with sin and expect God to look the other way. The word of God declares that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Wake up. Wake up. Samson knew that Delilah was deceitful. He knew that she was a bad influence. How could he not? Every time he told her one of his secret, the Philistines would attack, trying to use that very tactic that he had just told her. He knew Delilah's voice was deceitful, but he enjoyed her company, so he did not care and he did not change. And I'm speaking to somebody tonight. You are trapped in sexual sin that you think you have control over. God's calling you to wake up. God's calling you to wake up, whatever it is, if it's the internet, if it's pornography, if it's a relationship outside of the body of Christ, you can't play around with it and expect God to bless you. You can't play around with it and expect to be ready. When the rapture happens, you've got to wake up before it's too late. You've got to wake up. I'm speaking to someone who allows Hollywood and political correctness to dictate their worldview. You're doing a fine dance between the church and the world. You're excusing sin and you're dabbling in the thrills and pleasures of this present world. And you're getting away with it right now. But let me remind you that that day is coming. That two shall be in the field. One shall be taken and another left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken and another left. Watch therefore. Wake up. Wake up. It's going to be just like any other day. The day that Jesus Christ returns. Somebody, maybe somebody in this room, somebody hearing this very message will turn to slap a friend on the back for, and then their hand is just going to pass through empty air. And then it dawns on them that the sin that they had played with has kept them from glory. Somebody, maybe somebody in this room tonight We'll be on the phone with mom and dad reminiscing about old times and the line will go silent at the other end and a dread that they've been ignoring for years will come suddenly upon them because they were lulled to sleep. They were lulled to sleep. And not even taking into account the the, the second coming of Jesus Christ, your life is not, not confirmed for tomorrow. Life is a vapor. James 4 says, whereas ye know not what shall be tomorrow. For what is your life? It is but a vapor that appeareth just a little time and it vanishes away. You don't know how long you have left on this planet, whether it be by the rapture or, or God forbid something tragic happens. You're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised your next breath. It's just the mercy and grace of God that you are, are, are given the chance tonight to make things right. There's a song that says tomorrow, I'll give my life tomorrow. I've thought about today, but it's so much easier to say tomorrow. Who promised you tomorrow? You better choose the Lord today. Please don't just turn and walk away. Don't just turn and walk away. How long will you continue to play the odds? How long will you continue to be asleep at the wheel of life? Wake up. That discomfort that you feel right now as you sit in your seat is called conviction. And it is a sign of the love of God because he chastens those whom he loves in order to save them from the wrath to come. You can awaken. You can wake up. Tonight can be your night to change. Tonight can be your night to make things right. Tonight can be the night when you forsake that besetting sin. Tonight can be the night when you lay down that habit that has you bound. Tonight can be the night when you forsake that relationship that you know God disapproves of. Tonight can be the night 
where you make that change in your life. But please don't say tomorrow. Don't say tomorrow. Church, can we lift our hands and just talk to God and That's it. Just talk to God. Who promised you tomorrow? Well, that's it. Samson waited until it was too late and he was taken in captivity. And he, he eventually lost his life because he, he put everything off. He didn't change. He didn't listen. He didn't wake up. But you have a chance tonight to wake up. One more person in scripture we're going to talk about tonight. And that's King David. And the story is found in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. A man after God's own heart fell asleep. Which says to me that anybody can fall asleep. I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care how high on the, the, the status of, uh, I don't care how long you've, you've even been a pastor. I don't care how long you've been a, a saint of God. I don't care how long you've been a Sunday school teacher. I don't care how long you've been in this thing. You can still fall asleep. Because David serves as an example of a man after God's own heart who fell asleep. He got lazy. And when he should have been out fighting, with his troops and advancing the kingdom, he was resting on his laurels in the palace. And he was tempted much like Samson and he fell into sexual sin. And he then demonstrates the depravity of the human soul asleep at the, will, at the wheel of life when he has Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, killed in order to cover his own sin. He then takes Bathsheba into his own home and he thinks that he's covered it up and he's hid it. And then Nathan, his pastor, comes to him and tells him a horrifying story of how one rich man stole a lamb from a poor man for selfish reasons and David put on his best religious face and he was angry, he was wroth, he demanded that the man be brought to justice and restoration be made to the poor man who suffered and then he gets the wake up call of his life as Nathan points his finger in his face and says you are the man. You thought you had us fooled. You thought you had it all covered up. But while you may fool everyone around you, God sees what you do in the secret place. God sees what you do in the secret place. And that same principle that Jesus spoke of in Matthew chapter 6, that the Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly, that same principle applies to sin, unrepented sin. You will, enter, you will answer at the judgment for every time that you sinned and covered it up. Eventually, everybody will know, be sure that your sins will find you out. You might fake us out until eternity, but God sees you. And he stopped everything over the past two weeks to give you a chance to respond. And he's in this room saying, you are the man. You are the one who has done this. And it is time to wake up. And the words of the proverb stand, ring in my ears. How long will you sleep? How long will you sleep? How long will you slumber? When will you arise out of your sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of your hands to sleep. And your poverty will come as one that traveleth, as one that, as thy want, as an armed man, a naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh his eyes. He speaketh with his feet. He teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness is in his heart. He devises mischief continually and he sows discord. And this man who has fallen asleep at the wheel of his life, he's just going through life and he's winking at these little things that he, he knows are wrong, but he's, he's like, oh, but it's not that big a deal. And he's, and he's sowing discord and he's talking about this person and he's talking about that person. That person that has fallen asleep, his calamity shall come suddenly. In a moment. 
in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, it will be the greatest victory for some of us, but it will also be the greatest devastation for some of us. That's the reality of the second coming of Jesus Christ. So along with the proverb, I ask you, how long will you sleep? How long will you dabble in sin? How long will you cover up your secret? How long will you fool us all into thinking that you're okay? How long will you wait to forsake that besetting sin? How long will you go placing God on the back burner of your life? How long? How long? You can't afford to hit the snooze button one more time. You can't afford it because Jesus is coming and you're not promised your life tomorrow. You've got to wake up. You've got to wake up. You've got to wake up. Because falling asleep is dangerous when it is in the wrong area of your life and it is at the wrong time. It's dangerous. And music, you can come back. I'm coming to it close, but I wonder if we could stand all across this sanctuary. And the last scriptures that we're reading are found in Luke chapter 22. And it is the night of Jesus, Judas' betrayal of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, in Luke chapter 22, verse 39, he came out and went as he was wont, as he normally did. He went to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that you enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared unto him an angel, from heaven strengthening him and being in agony he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as it were the great drops of blood falling down to the ground and when he rose from prayer he was come to his disciples and at this moment in history when Jesus Christ is preparing to offer himself as the perfect sacrifice for your sin and for my sin his disciples were found asleep his disciples were found asleep and he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, yes, ye, lest ye enter into temptation. And at the most impacting moment in human history, as the new covenant was about to be opened and established, a new dispensation of time was opening, the veil was about to be rent, and the church was close to its birth. Jesus was about to be offered as a living sacrifice for our sin. This is the most important moment to date in human existence, and the disciples were asleep. They were asleep. And now, at the next impacting moment in human history, as this new covenant and dispensation of time is coming to a close. I fear tonight that some of us will be found as the disciples were in Gethsemane asleep. But the difference is that they had an opportunity after they missed the moment. They had a chance to make it right and Peter went and wept as great tears of sorrow and he repented and he made it right with God. But after the moment when that trumpet sounds and the dead are raised, you don't have another chance. We don't have that luxury this time. There are signs pointing towards it. The alarm clock is going tonight in this room that Jesus is coming. This is your chance to wake up. This is your opportunity to make things right with God. The first coming of Jesus was missed by those who should have seen it coming. And help us Pentecostals, blessed over the past century, full of knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not to be lulled to sleep by religious tradition, worldly priorities, and unrepented sin. And I echo the voice of Paul who said, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days, they are evil. We're getting closer and closer and closer to the coming of Jesus Christ. Awake! 
wake up God has set before you life and death blessing and cursing therefore choose life choose life today you have two choices tonight and I know in a world that loves to, to play in the gray area, nobody likes black or white types of things anymore. But you have one of two choices to make tonight. You can walk out the back door unchanged by the presence of God and continue to be lulled to sleep by the world around you. Or you can come to this altar and wake up and get things right with God. Those are your two choices tonight. Those are your two choices tonight. Which will you choose? Will you wake from your slumber? Will you wake from your sleep? Will you once and for all turn from the things, the pleasures, the riches, the sin that does so easily beset? Will you for once and for all lay aside every weight tonight? Will you once and for all make it right with God? And if we will, if we confess, and if we wake up tonight, the Bible says if we will confess our sins, He is faithful, and He is just, and He will forgive us our sins, and He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you wake up, there's a promise in Scripture that God's going to be right there beside you, helping you day by day by day to live the decision that you make around this altar tonight. And I wonder at this moment, if you would if if you want to have any sort of relationship with god if you would come from where you're seated and come to this altar as a symbol and as a sign that i want to be awake when jesus comes back does anybody want to be awake when jesus comes back i don't want to be stuck asleep at the wheel of life I don't want to be asleep. Maybe you feel like you're okay, but I challenge you tonight. Take a step out of where you've been and come to this altar and make that priority. Make that decision to wake up. That's it, that's it. As you're coming. As you're coming, that's it. God will meet you here at this altar. God will meet you here. God will meet you here. Sir, don't let the hardness in your heart keep you from eternity. Ma'am, don't let your fear of what others think of you keep you from eternity. It's the alarm clock of Scripture. Wake up. Wake up! I need a saint of God to go to prayer right now. I need a saint of God. If you know that you're right with God, I need you to pray in the Holy Ghost right now. It's praying in the Holy Ghost that softens the hard heart. It's praying in the Spirit that, that, that brings revelation and understanding to the heart that is blinded to their own deception. Oh.
that's it church it's better that we are in the house of mourning tonight because we're in the house when we're in the house of mourning when we're in the house where we realize that we've got to make some changes that's when we are changed for eternity that's when when things are made right that's it thou that sleepest awake thou that sleepest awake thou that sleepest awake thou that sleepest that world that you've given yourself to that world of career that world of money that world of relationship that's a dream it's not real eternity is real eternity is real if you feel to pray with somebody step out and do that if you feel directed by the Holy Ghost to go and pray with somebody feel free oh Jesus Jesus